Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Compare's webinar on the view of the end investor. So it's been a year like no other, but actually from our business performance figures, it shows the wealth management industry has been as resilient as ever and has actually continued to deliver strong results. However, the key question is, what do the clients actually think and how has the pandemic impacted their view of wealth management firms? So this is going to be a key focus of our webinar today. And we're going to start with a couple of presentations. So both are going to be covering results from the end investor research. And then to finish the webinar, we have a panel session with industry experts. So as with each of our webinars, if you'd like to pose a question to the panel, uh, at any point, please use the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. And I'll look to get as many of these questions answered as possible during the panel session. But so let's get started with our first presentation, where I'm delighted to welcome Welcome Kim Woodhall from Creologix with her presentation entitled Improving the Digital Experience for Investors. Well, welcome, Kim, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So today we'll be looking at how conversational interactions um, can be used to improve your client's digital experience. And what I'll be covering today is looking at the the case for conversational interactions online, embracing the conversational um, user interface mindset, and going having a look at some potential applications that could be used by wealth management firms. And then lastly, looking at how delivering um, digital services can be aligned with your brand. Next slide, please. So in terms of the case for conversational interactions online, Compeer's uh, recent survey shows that only 5% of clients seldom or never access their accounts online. Um, and of those that do, 60% of clients access their ac accounts weekly or monthly, and 21% access their accounts daily, which is um, probably a lot more than many people realize. And uh, this shows that there are the number of um, interactions that can be done digitally um, are all opportunities for a firm to provide outstanding client service and value to their clients. And these online tasks can range from administrative actions such as a client changing their contact details, to viewing their accounts online um, and also expressing their investment preferences. Um, for example, 51% of clients view uh, online valuations and performance reports. Therefore, given the frequency and variety of interactions um, that a client can do online, it's really important that any digital offering reflects the client-focused standards of your brand and conversational interactions can improve client engagement and provide support for navigating a digital platform. Next slide, please. So looking at how to embrace the conversational user interface mindset, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about conversational this year, especially in terms of with the backdrop of um, the pandemic and uh, the need to offer um, alternative ways of meeting with clients and interacting with them uh, when it hasn't been possible to meet with them in person. Uh, it has raised questions, though, about, well, what's the difference between chat, secure messaging, app notifications, and conversational UI? So look at it, in, in terms of that, a conversational mindset is about building bridges between the separate functions and between information, tasks, and communication channels. Conversational user interfaces can range from quick transactional interactions online to richer and more personal communication. And um, next, I'm going to show you uh, some potential applications for conversational UI at wealth management firms. Next slide, please. So this first example um, shows how um, a wealth management business could address compliance requirements um, in a, 
a simpler and efficient uh, way through digital channels. For example, with MIFID II, investment management firms are required to send 10% depreciation portfolio notifications uh, to clients within 24 hours, uh, which when it happens can be quite challenging to, to manage to do that. So uh, this shows how um, impacted clients can be sent push notifications and from there, they can use their app to um, log in through using a, a face ID verification tool. And from there, um, be guided into reading a, a personalized update about their portfolio and also um, to read more about uh, what's happening in the markets. From there, it guides them um, to give them the option to either through a chat function to uh, contact their advisor, to either speak with them or to book a meeting with them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, with this example, um, a firm would be able to um, collect client preferences either for news um, or areas of interest and then be able to send them um, targeted information that that client is interested in. So in this example, we looked at a client who, um, you know, is logged into their account and then they uh, get a, an alert that they've uh, received um, an investment tip. And in this example, they get a personalized notice saying, you know, based on your investment preferences, we thought we'd, you would like to hear about this new ESG fund. Um, and from there, they can either read it later or um, click into reading more about it and um, you know, watch a video or whatever information is available um, to them. And then from there, it enables them to initiate um, further discussion with the advisor about it through the online chat function, um, directing them to speak with the advisor. Next slide, please. Another area that um, conversational uh, could be used is for administrative tasks. And this would enable um, client administrators to uh, contact clients through digital um, interactions. And uh, you know, in the business world, there, there might be various things that need to be updated periodically, certain forms. Or um, in this example, we just we chose one that that might be needed, which is um, perhaps a, a passport copy is expired, or um, you know, or an updated version of it is needed. And so, an administrator could send a, a message to the client saying, you know, please can you send us an updated copy of your your ID, um, and then it would guide them to where they need to uh, upload it. And in this case, with uh, providing a copy of their passport. They could um, scan a copy of it, upload the image, and it would all be saved digitally. Um, and there would be a recognition that the task has been completed. And this would be a very um, simple and efficient way from the business side and also for the client. Um, it's a very easy journey to be able to, to complete um, required documentation. Next slide, please. Um, this shows how um, conversational can be used to seamlessly integrate both face-to-face uh, -face service and digital service offerings. And in this example, um, a client meeting could be done through a video chat. And then um, after the meeting, um, which has been recorded, a copy of it would be transcribed automatically, which um, can be saved on the advisor side for audit purposes. Um, if there's ever a need to review and go back to what uh, was discussed in the meeting and any um, decisions made, and a copy of it can be sent to the client as well. This would be a time saver for um, the advisor who would have to type up meeting notes. Um, and it's also a, a great way to kind of keep records um, for different purposes for the client, for the advisor, and also for compliance. 
And then from there, um, the advisor can send um, documents to the client digitally, uh, which is much quicker than sending it in the mail. They'd be able to read it on there and the advisor could um, see whether the clients had a chance to read it yet or not before following up with them. Um, and also could send um, any documents that need to be signed um, and they can ask them to provide their e-signature um, digitally as well. And copies of all these documents and what's been signed would be saved um, digitally and there'd be a record um, you know, of what's been completed. And the advisor and client can um, have a com you know uh, have ongoing conversation after the meeting where the advisor provides updates on uh, what's happening with their accounts. If the account's transferring, they could give an update um, and also offer uh, to send a link to the client asking them uh, to schedule the next follow-up meeting. Okay, next slide, thanks. So um, it's, this shows how you can uh, deliver digital services that are aligned with your brand. Um, and it's really important to take that into account when um, building your digital services. The examples just provided uh, show how conversational interactions can seamlessly integrate your digital and in-person service offering. And a, a flexible, intuitive solution will create positive client interactions that boost client loyalty. Um, it's also an opportunity to reimagine processes from a digital first perspective um, that can uh, provide a chance to really improve the business efficiency um, of those processes. And also putting the client first when considering how to implement them, thinking about how to um, implement them in a way which is really convenient, easy to use and adds value for your clients. Um, this shows that um, any part of the user journey online can be improved without compromising the unique value proposition of your firm. If you would like to discuss any of these ideas further, please feel free to contact us at Creologics. Um, you're welcome to book a, a private workshop with our expert team. Thank you. I'll now hand you back to James. Well, thank you very much, Kim. Now we're now going to move on to our second presentation, where I am delighted to be joined by my colleague, Tom Thwaites, who's going to be sharing the results from Compares and Investor Research. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, James. Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. As James mentioned, Compere have conducted our annual end investor research into affluent and high net worth investors. And over the next 10 minutes, my presentation will break down the key findings of our survey. The slides are quite data heavy, so if you aren't able to take it all in, don't worry, a copy of the slides will be made available to you all after the webinar. Uh, next slide, please. To break down our sample, it contains a range of 500 investors of all ages and asset values, which will represent some of your core client, core client base today. By portfolio size, we have purposefully spoken to 100 clients with over £1 million of investable assets, so that the results cover the full spectrum of mass affluent to high net worth, with a few even in the ultra high net worth bracket. Finally, by gender, the sample we was slightly male dominant with 61%, but each year we conduct this research, we step closer to a 50-50 split. Next slide, please. So we begin by looking at what journey the client goes through when selecting a wealth service provider. As you can see, our sample of investors use a fairly even split of providers from traditional wealth managers to private banks with the largest cohort using an IFA. And when we asked about how they found out about these services, the main response is still through referrals, which remain the leading source of new business in the industry, but only just. When you compare this to last year's data, we can see that the importance of online marketing has increased significantly, raising from 22% to 42%, which demonstrates that the investment into digital marketing is certainly paying off as it was almost caught up with the level of referrals. And when clients are selecting a wealth provider, investment performance remains their top priority. 
with the majority of clients expecting anywhere between 5% and 8% of annual, annual growth net of fees. Although it must be said this is expected in a typical year, not necessarily what we've witnessed in 2020. Next slide, please. So how do clients feel about their current providers? Well, we ask clients to rate their current providers out of 10 across these key areas. Overall, it seems clients are pretty happy with the quality of service they are receiving, average scores remaining consistently just above 7 out of 10. However, with no score achieving an average of 8 out of 10, it suggests there is plenty of work to be done. Also, when we look at the scores over time, this year's scores were 0.6 points lower on average than in 2018, also suggesting action needs to be taken to prevent client satisfaction from sliding further. Some of these factors, such as investment performance and firm reputation, may be longer term issues to tackle, but there is little excuse for falling standards in politeness and responsiveness of employees and access to the client's main point of contact. However, despite the slight reduction in these ratings, it is a strong sign that 50% of clients feel that value for money they receive from their wealth manager has either improved or significantly improved this year. It is worrying to see that 10% feel this value has gone down in the last 12 months, but given the difficulties faced this year, this can be somewhat expected. Next slide, please. So with evident room for improvement, we ask clients where exactly they would like to see improvements be made across the following areas. This was done on a four point scale with the table summarizing the percentage of clients who suggest either a significant or very significant changes are required. I've then compared these figures with the subgroups of investors under the age of 40 and the wealthier clients with more than 1 million pounds of assets to see the difference in attitudes between these core groups. Unsurprisingly this year, investments investment performance was the highest requested area for improvement across all of the groups. While the second highest scoring area for improvement is to client education seminars, possibly as a direct result of the uncertainty coronavirus has caused in the market, it seems that clients wish to understand more about their portfolios and the implications of market movements given the volatility we've seen this year. While looking at the data for the younger clients, they show an expected desire for more improvements to be made across digital services, such as portals and mobile apps, as well as improvements to quality of service from staff and stability of staff. And as for the wealthiest clients, the biggest request is for a more bespoke service. Next slide, please. It's fair to say that this year has been quite tough on the industry. And as such, we might expect to see client satisfaction levels have declined to some extent. However, this has not necessarily been the case. Overall, it appears that firms have been successful in their efforts to guide clients through a turbulent year, despite the poor market conditions. One factor which has helped this greatly was the relationship with their advisor, who have successfully reassured their clients throughout the crisis. Figures show that despite a dip in performance, 75% of clients feel, wealth, feel their wealth manager has kept them on track with their personal goals and targets. Finally, we asked clients if they would recommend their current provider to a friend based on their performance throughout 2020. And with 86% saying yes, we can say that the industry has been largely successful in dealing with the pandemic. Next slide, please. One of the current reason, one of the reasons for the positive reaction from clients can be linked to the level of contact with their wealth provider. Results show that 55% of clients have had more or significantly more communication with their advisor throughout the first lockdown period. A large amount of this can be credited to the use of digital tools, which have allowed advisors to manage their client relationship and provide more frequent updates and information about their investments while working at a distance. As well as the level of communication, the quality of communication appears to be strong too. As clients rate their providers well, in their ability to communicate about their assets, investment ideas, and conditions in the market. Some of these scores could be boosted with the introduction of more client education seminars and more regular surveys to listen to client feedback. While larger changes to the current systems of client reporting could provide clients with more regular updates on the progress of their assets. Next slide, please. To finish off with, we can look at client attitudes towards investment strategies. With investment performance the main attraction for the majority of clients when selecting a firm, 
This is a crucial area for firms to get right. Once again, clients are quite happy across the board when it comes to their financial targets. Scores average above seven out of 10 when it comes to understanding and setting the client's individual goals, working on their risk appetite and providing appropriate products and services to meet these goals. So to answer the question of today's webinar, yes, it seems CIOs are meeting their clients' requirements despite the market conditions the pandemic has caused. And finally, when looking at one of the biggest trends in wealth management, ESG, it seems that demand for these services has grown immensely this year, with 53% of clients showing an increased level of interest in ESG. However, we can also see in the table that this demand is led heavily by not only the younger investors, which we would typically expect, but even more so by the wealthier clients, with 67% of investors with over a million pounds of assets showing more interest in ESG over the last 12 months. So that concludes my presentation for today. Now, as I already mentioned, if you missed anything on the slides or would just like to see the results again, a copy will be made available to download from the Compeer website alongside all of our previous webinars. I would like to thank you all for listening today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. I'll now pass back over to James. Thank you very much, Tom. And um, we will, we're now gonna move on to our panel session. So may I just remind you that if you would like to pose a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And on the panel today, I'm delighted to be joined by Darrell Roxburgh of Beta Risk, James Lawson of Tribe Impact Capital, and Alan Higgins of Coots. So welcome everyone. And if we could just start with a brief introduction to yourselves. So let's start with you, Daryl, please. Thanks, James. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Daryl Roxborough, President and Global Head of Beta Risk, part of the Core Financial Group. We're specialist software providers to the private wealth management sector, covering client suitability and risk profiling, portfolio management and monitoring, risk and ESG management. Approximately 180 billion of AUM is managed through our systems in the, in the UK market. We've just launched our ESG manager module and so are very interested in the results from Compeer's survey today. Thank you, James. Thank you, Daryl. And James, how about you? Brief introduction, please. Hi, James. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is James Lawson. I am one of the co-founders of Tribe Impact Capital. Um, Tribe is a specialist impact wealth manager, which means that we only provide um, portfolios to our clients that are designed for both financial return and uh, or social and environmental return. Um, the business is just now in its fourth year. Um, and at the same time, I sit on the board of a charity called Unlimited and on the investment committee there supporting social entrepreneurs around the UK and delighted to join you all this afternoon. Thank you, James and Alan. Thank you, James. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Higgins. I'm CIO of Coots, the private bank here in the UK. And um, just a bit of background, I've basically had 15 years experience in institutional asset management, mainly fixed income, and about 15 years multi-asset class on the private banking side. And over 10 years of that at Coots. Thank you. Well, um, let's move on to the first question. And this is more geared towards Alan and James, but and quite a broad one. So what changes to the overall level of client satisfaction have you witnessed as a result of the pandemic? So let's start with you, Alan. Let's see. So um, a surprisingly resilient performance, I would say, in terms of client satisfaction via exactly what we're doing now, Zoom. I think uh, clients took to it pretty pretty quickly, both on an individual basis. Uh, but, uh, there are other providers apart from Zoom, I should add. Um, people took to this kind of format uh, pretty quickly on an individual basis. And it became in particularly important in March and April when clearly uh, client portfolios were down substantially. Uh, but also, encouragingly, um, events. So, you know, classic uh, investment events that we might have at 440 Stranded Coots. We, we tend to get a good show, but we get a lot of no-shows, of course. People have better things to do. But actually, surprisingly, it's a lot easier to click on these kind of links and you know, they've got a spare hour, uh, it, kind of watch what we have to say. So we've been getting good feedback 
from this, but I think you do miss you do miss some of the interaction. I think that we have when it's a seminar and and, and it's full of and and the room can really get involved. But it's been pretty effective, I have to say, the, communicating by Zoom, Microsoft, Blue Jeans, WebEx, just to mention the other competitors, and there's probably others out there. Thank you. And James, how about you? Is it similar? Yeah, it's sim similar. Um, and I guess uh, Coots is a much larger institution than Tribe, so maybe um, some of the questions that our clients might have had was about, um, well, like all clients, the first question they always have is, is my money safe? And so it's quite, you know, uh, some of our messaging is probably different than it is from a larger institution. Um, but like many uh, of our peers, um, operationally, we were well set up, so the move to um, full BCP um, worked quite, quite um, uh, fluidly. Um, we had we had an interesting situation where um, uh, we had also discovered that our landlord went into administration at the same time. So we were operating on a BCP of a BCP. But still, thanks to Zoom uh, and others, things seem to work quite quite well, and clients didn't really notice any difference at all. Um, I, I mean, we'll come on to, to talk about some of the, um, the the feedback we get from in terms of the investment strategies that we run, because that's obviously a major part of, of how our clients interact with us in terms of how we're feeding back and communicating with them. But um, overall, I think, yeah, you know, th there's a lot of um, there's a lot of disruption in a lot of industries and wealth management, I feel, is probably one of the ones that is. It's creaking rather than being decimated like um, some other sectors outside of, of finance. So broadly, we've we, yeah, um, we've, we've weathered that storm, and, and clients have been uh, quite intrigued in terms of what's happened to their portfolios uh, over the past, I guess, twelve months. Thank you. And um, we mentioned about um, investment performance there. And um, so, the next question is: How can firms ensure they remain on track with their clients' investment goals? despite the um, drop in values that a, a highly volatile market provides. But so let's start with Daryl on this one. Thanks, James. Um, I think it's probably all about the longer and medium term. Um, if the client's been educated at the beginning uh, as part of their suitability approach um, about the fluctuations in a market, um, nothing will have probably quite prepared them for the early part of this year. Uh, but we have recovered um, and recovered quite substantially. I think keeping on track is a case of monitoring the portfolios, um, ensuring that they are in line with um, the agreed mandate of the client and the, uh, the performance expectations, as I say, over the medium and longer term. And if you can demonstrate that to the client that you've got control and process around it, it's going to give them the comfort and confidence that they need. Great. And Alan, how about uh, at Coots? How are you making sure that uh, the client's uh, investment goals are still being met? So it um, has to be longer term. I know it's a boring thing to say, and we're all going to say it. Why? Because equities, the principal volatile risk contributor, are volatile. They, th it's a very attractive return stream, demonstrated over multiple decades, but with volatility. So that's what we spend an awful lot of time doing is, is, is getting clients to extend their time horizons and, if you like, coming to terms with corrections in markets. I mean, we, we do have risk mitigation strategies such as government bonds, uh, gold, alternative strategies where they can work. But nevertheless, equities tend to dominate. Um, look, um, most clients are absolutely fine, but we did have a couple, uh, a couple I can remember uh, end March, early April, who, who are growth clients, so naturally exposed to more equities uh, that, than, than other clients who said, well, I didn't really see myself as a growth client. And uh, so the interesting behavioral aspect of terms of wanting to receive the upside, but uncomfortable with the downside. Um, I mean, luckily in those situations, talk, talk the client through the situation and, and they remained invested. Often the, the most valuable thing we can do, you mentioned CIOs, but CIOs and advisors is frankly keeping clients invested. That is so much more valuable than anything else, whether they're with Coots or with anyone. No, I'd agree. Right. Uh, and James, have you got anything to add? 
Um, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not going to say evaluate us over the short term, um, but I, I do think there's something that, that Alan picks up there around that that initial, and Dara mentioned as well, around the initial engagement with the client and trying to uh, understand really what is quite a complex thing, which is the, the risk personality of, a, of an individual. Whereas investors, we tend to see them as a, as a that, that translated as a strategic asset allocation. We are fundamentally dealing with human beings who don't think of themselves as a strategic asset allocation. They think of themselves in terms of passion and fear and greed. And what our, our role is is to try and is to try and codify that, I guess, and also to to hold their hands. As I said, we we are most of our clients are are in portfolios that have inherent volatility because of their exposure to the market. So what we need to be doing is talking to our clients. Uh, and um, I guess that that's been another great uh, opportunity over the past sort of twelve months is to test communication. Uh, when we, uh, I mean, it's the, it's a classic thing, right? The best time to plant a tree was twenty years ago. The best time to start talking to your clients regularly was twenty years ago. It certainly wasn't in the kind of March. If in, in March and April you started regularly talking to your clients, the nervousness is that why am I suddenly being spoken to every month by my wealth manager? What is going wrong? You need to have that communication that needs to have started before the crisis. Otherwise, you risk exacerbating the problem um, in terms of um, you know, suddenly getting all this communication from a wealth manager. I thought this is a discretionary relationship that I should be evaluating over the long term. So why are you sending me an email once a week telling me what's going on in my portfolio? We need to work out how to balance those communication needs because ultimately, everyone, most people here are medium to long-term investors. Don't judge um, us over two or three months. Judge us over three to six years. Thank you. And um, a hot topic we've seen in wealth management has been ESG. And uh, the investor findings showed that actually it's been a very strong demand for ESG products. So have you seen something similar? Or do you think actually the pandemic may have acted as a bit of a distraction for some people in terms of ESG investments? And uh, I'll stay with you, James, as obviously this is a very much an area of expertise for Tribe. So for Tribe, uh, ESG, uh, we, we take as a proxy for environmental, social and governance scores. We take that as a proxy for a kind of well-run business. So for us, that's necessary, but not sufficient. We want well-run businesses solving big problems. So you might have well-run oil and gas businesses. We prefer well-run businesses that are, are actually physically out there with a product or service that is aligned to a sustainable development goal. But so broadly, ESG is definitely part of the language that we speak. And of course, I'm, I'm sitting here only seeing one side of traffic. I'm not seeing the people who are going, wow, COVID's really interesting. Uh, it's forced me to look at my investment portfolio and really work out what the underlying businesses are trying to solve for. And goodness gracious me, the world needs more ice cream. Let's ignore ESG. Let's start buying booze and uh, um, you know, cruise stocks. We don't see that. We only see the other bit, which is people coming to us saying, actually, what are, what are the businesses doing that I'm supporting my capital with? What, what, what are they? What are they did? What do they do during the crisis? Did they start making hand sanitizer? Um, did they? Which is great, but at some point they've got to switch back to making perfume again. What, what, why should they be doing that? What, why fundamentally did they? Um, why does the world need more perfume? Do, do I want my capital in businesses that are, are solving that particular problem, or do I want my, my capital deployed to more fundamental? challenges like um, sustainable agriculture, the circular economy, um, renewable resources, access to financial uh, inclusion. So for us, the crisis, a bit like Brexit, forced wealth holders to kind of go, what's the purpose of this money? Yeah, of course, I'm looking for it to generate some financial return, but why? And it, whilst I'm doing it, what can I be, what else can I be doing with that, with those assets? Is there or should I just be literally forgetting about it and, and seeing my banker again in 12 months' time? Our view is that actually, if we can get our clients engaged in what their uh, investments are up to, if we can get them interested, it means we can communicate with them more regularly. It means that they are more engaged. And I don't know of any consumer sector in the world where having a more engaged client isn't a better result for the client. We want our clients to be engaged with what they're up to. It's just the financial services typically hasn't been that good at doing that. So yeah, for us, certainly we've seen a, a, a lot more um, talk about ESG. We've seen a lot more interest in what we're doing. Inevitably, there is going to be uh, a bit of froth in the market, a bit of, especially in the marketing of some of these products and services. Um, but as I say, I have a, a, a um, slightly, well, I have a very 
a biased view on, on that. So um, uh, you may get a more balanced view some, from some of the, the rest of the panelists here. Sure. Uh, Daryl, coming from the view of uh, a supplier to the industry, have you seen a large pickup in the requests for ESG investments? Um, I think not so much in the investment from my perspective, but in the way of managing and communicating it with the client. Um, if you think about it from the private wealth perspective, you've got three outward facing elements. You've got collecting the client's preferences, you've got managing the portfolio, and then you've got reporting and analyzing on it. And there's a fourth one lurking in the background, which is regulation, uh, which is coming in this space, uh, whether it's the EU taxonomy or SFDR, um, there is going to be needs for firms to report on this. I think James made an excellent point. Um, froth added by marketing. Um, ESG's had a, a, a fantastic wind behind it in terms of um, the uh, performance it's exhibited as we as we went through the first half of this year, and has carried on uh, thereafter. But I think you know, we've done a lot of research in this space, um, talking to uh, wealth management firms in the UK and the US, um, and we're seeing that their clients um, are. It's been a reflective time for them. As James says, you know, there's, they've developed interest in how are companies dealing with their staff during the pandemic. Uh, they've got an, a sentiment to invest for good and also invest for safety, um, all of which drives them down an ESG route. And I, I think it's always a misnomer that ESG is all about the environment. That's a very important part of it, um, but it is about sustainable um, corporate governance as well as um, social, which is again, sustainable corporate governments um, uh, and the environment. And you take those and look at them as investment factors, they actually become key to any investment decision in terms of looking at the environmental risks that a company for, uh, faces, the carbon risks it faces and so on. So I see ESG actually just becoming part of mainstream investment going forward. Okay, and Alan, would you agree with that? And how have you seen the demand for ESG products within your clients' portfolios? Yeah, so I, I have to agree. I'll, I'll comment a little bit about, about the froth. I, I should say in terms of Coots, we've always managed, uh, like a lot of wealth management firms, ethical portfolios. These would be the classic portfolios where you have exclusions, uh, tobacco or armaments, et cetera. Um, but we decided several years ago that rather than having an ESG side of our business, we'll, we'll look at all of our portfolios through an ESG lens. Even, for example, we have effectively a, um, for, just for people on the call, they'll know it, a kind of a nutmeg competitor, an index tracker. And uh, there are now uh, ESG indices. So we've replaced, for example, stand, in, in where we can, some st standard market cap uh, in index exposure with ESG index exposure, and um, as as Daryl mentioned, what, what you know, one of the side effects of what's happened this year, it's actually been a positive alpha. It's ESG products have outperformed, so th th uh, they've they've definitely got legs uh, in terms of that. Why I don't think it's a bubble or frothy is because what's happening in the United States actually, in particular. Um, the fact that the ERISA rules, US pensions, which are still vast, specifically stated that uh, portfolio managers should not take into account uh, ESG factors and, and should remain with the fiduciary responsibility of, of returns, which was very, very interesting. And, and, and just in general, what we do find is that there's 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 just uh, of course it's there in the United States, but it's just much much less prevalent, much less prevalent than than what we see over here in Europe and Asia. So um, and given the size of the U.S. market, therefore we we don't think it's a bubble. Having said that, as we speak right now, there is a large value rotation happening, and ESG is underperforming for a bit, um, but it's nowhere near wiped out the strong performance that we've seen this year. Thank you, Alan. Now, uh, a vital point of um, communicating with clients is the um, the client reports, and for example, the valuation reports. So, um, have you seen uh, a change to um, your format of these during the lockdown period, or do you foresee your reporting changing in the next twelve months? And I'll stay with you, Alan. 
so pretty hard to change reporting. Uh, we're in a fortunate position, you know, to have thousands and thousands of clients um, because uh, apart from Coots, where we have also thousands, but we also mm-hmm. look after NatWest customers. So that picks up several thousand more. So it tends to be fairly standardized. Um, the, I guess online uh, on and on the mobile phone, um, we do have uh, for Coots clients and, it, and, and it's going to be NatWest clients going forward. Um, so, so, but that's really been a trend. Um, so specifically over this period, kind of, it's been fairly standard client reporting, quite frankly. Okay. And James, how about at, at Tribe? Has reporting changed at all for you? Um, I, I guess it's changed, um, but not as a result of the COVID um, crisis, really. So, so um like Alan's fortunate to have tens of thousands of clients. We're fortunate enough to not have tens of thousands of clients, which means that when we built our reporting package, we could say, right, we've, we're starting from scratch four years ago. What are the kind of things that we'd like to put in and, uh, and what, what goes in there? So obviously there are the transaction reporting and the, and the regulatory requirements, but also um, our view was that there's a lot more impact data that we can get out to our clients. So yes, it's interesting to know vol and returns against a benchmark, but actually you might want to know the millions of tons that have uh, not gone into landfill as a result of the investments in your portfolio or the carbon sequestered in your portfolio as compared to the benchmark, the gender balance in your portfolio. Those are all quantitative measures that we are building out this year. Carbon, I think, is probably the one that most people are comfortable with because there's there's the widest usage of that, but we're adding more and more of those impact metrics. The other thing is that, you know, everyone loves a metric, and I doubt there are many people on here who don't like a metric or a spreadsheet, but actually human beings, again, we're storytellers, right? We fundamentally exist as a species because we like telling stories to one another. And so we've spent time uh, going through trying to find the stories in the portfolios. So trying to highlight the fact that actually within your portfolio that exists this company, uh, and it's either held directly or held within a fund, and this company is doing something that you might find really interesting. And again, going back to the point that if we can get our clients engaged and interested in their portfolios, they are much more comfortable along the journey, especially the volatility journey, that is long-term, medium-term investing. So we can get, if we can help on, as Daryl said, that third leg of the consumer journey about reporting and letting the client know what's going on in their portfolio, that's really important. And if we can support that, making sure the client is comfortable, making sure they're engaged, we think, again, we think the client ends up with better outcomes in terms of return outcomes as well as, as generally being a happier um, woman or man. Okay. And um, Daryl, is there anything you'd like to add on the reporting side and how well yeah. managers manage to improve um, it? Interestingly, what we've seen from our clients is that, um, echoing points made earlier um, by Alan, there's much more face-to-face time now with clients. Uh, because it's easier to actually meet the client for a, a brief meeting um, and have a discussion with them. So what we've been asked for is how can we help the the manager in the investment narrative with that client? So whether it's um, things that we've been doing for years, like looking at the macro factor exposure of your portfolio, what are your exposures to different um, uh, things in the economy, um, which is a bit um, dry compared to uh, the ESG side of the world, or going through, um, as we've just been talking about, looking at the carbon emissions from different companies, what's actually your weighted carbon tonnage uh, per position in your portfolio? Did you know that this stock generates 10 times as much carbon uh, for the same invested um, pound that you've got in it? And so we've built out um, much more interactive reporting that can be shared with the client via a, um, a Zoom Teams or other, uh, other source. Um, and uh, allowing that narrative to grow in the ESG space, looking at the positive, as James says, from the impact stocks within the portfolio. And it was great. One of our um, heads of private clients said, you know, this is an absolute game changer in client communications, the way that you're presenting this. So um, I think this is something that will grow and grow as people interact more with their clients um, through digital media. Thank you, Daryl. Now, uh, just our, our last question now. Looking, we're getting our crystal balls out. 
And um, so there appears no clear date for when the um, market uncertainty is going to end. I mean, it's a possibility of a lockdown three early in the new year. So just the final question is, how do you think client expect cha- expectations are going to change going forward? So initially in the, the next 12 months, maybe even looking further forward beyond that. So I'll start with you, Darren, as you hear. Well, a very, very long time ago when I started in the city, each of us had to um, spend time with one of the elder statesmen of the investment business. And he used to take us through how he made money for his clients investing after the crash. And he was talking about the 1929 crash. And he said, it's about quality and long term. I think in my time in the city, I've seen multiple corrections. And I think this is about educating the client. Um, And it's the trade-off between return and um, safety in a portfolio. And it's a trade-off between return and your time horizon. And if you can understand that and help the client understand that, you can help them set their expectations. And then you can manage to those expectations through time. So I think it all comes down to the relationship with the client, their manager, um, and ensuring that they've been profiled in a way that has educated them about what risk means. Okay, and Alan, how about you? How do you think your clients are going to change their expectations in both the near and far future? Good question. I hope they don't become scarred. What I did notice after 08, 09, especially when we ran into 2011 and the Eurozone crisis quickly, a lot of clients became scarred and just were very reluctant to invest in risk assets. Uh, this time with the, the comeback in the market so swiftly, maybe that will be mitigated. But, but I think Daryl's right. I think we just have to continue to educate our clients about the nature of returns and um, uh, that, you know, I have a, a pretty good slide. I show that a graph of the S&P 500 versus a straight line, a real fund. And I, I can say you can have you can have all this volatility or this straight line and nearly everyone goes for the straight line. And, and those on, on the call may guess what I'm going to talk about. The straight line was Madoff. There yes. is a human desire to avoid volatility. And um, that brings it alive, the fact that uh, you have to accept some kind of volatility. Um, but um, it's it's been like that virtually my whole career in wealth management, quite different from institutional, where on the institutional side, a pension fund or a sovereign wealth fund wanted this mandate, wanted to do that, get on with it. But wealth management, the behavioral side, understanding of the nature of returns is very important. Thank you. And uh, James, what are your views in terms of future client expectations? Well, I mean, I guess the, there is, uh, and I'll, I'll bow to the, the knowledge of the rest of the panelists. My sense is that in terms of absolute return expectations, that at least the, the, there are fewer clients coming in saying, I want, I'm, I want 20% a year risk-free for the next four years. I think more and more people are comfortable with the fact we are in a low interest rate um, environment and will be for a long time. Therefore, financial returns are likely to be driven some way by an underlying by, by the interest rate in some in some manner. So the, the the quantum of the return in terms of the financial return, I think, is is going to be something that, as Darren um, has expressed better than I can. I think the, for me, the other thing is that, that we have this Pandora's box that we opened a little bit in, in Brexit and we've massively opened now in COVID, which is what are you actually your investments doing? So, so not just about what the return of the vol numbers, but what are the businesses that are in there? And, and of course, I'd say this, but um, I, I do think it's a it's a box. And once you've opened, once we've said to our clients, this is what happened to to the businesses that you're invested in during COVID. This is how they behaved in the same way as we all were either employed or employers, and we think about how we behave as a, as, a, as institutions, how we treat our employees. Clients, we think about how their businesses behaved. I just don't think in twenty years' time. Clients are going to be saying, well, actually, you know what? In 2020, I sort of cared about what my investments were up to, but I don't care anymore to show me the money. I just don't think that's going to happen. I think we've got this sense of we've, we can show clients more about beyond just the, the metrics in terms of the balance sheet and the financial statements of the, uh, in their investments. And I think that's, again, the next step of where we're, where we're at. We, as Tribe, call ourselves impact wealth managers, I think, as Daryl has mentioned. 
I think we'll probably stop using that at some point because I think more and more, um, as Coots have done, you know, this just becomes a part of the process. It becomes less of a kind of, here's a style tilt we've taken towards ESG or towards impact. And more simply, we just think it's a better way of, of running uh, clients. And obviously, that's what we do at Tribe. And, and um, it sounds like there's some you know, nodding heads all, all over, which is always wonderful. Great. Well, well that's all, all the questions that we've had today. So um, first of all, I'd very much like to thank each of our panelists for their time and their detailed and open responses. It, um, I also would like to take my hat off to the wealth management firms for maintaining a very strong satisfaction levels in extreme conditions and long may that continue. And it appears certainly that education is going to be key going forward for the client base. Thank you also to um, Tom and Kim for their presentations. And thank you all for um, logging in today and listening. And um, as Tom mentioned, we will be sharing the, the slides on our website. And um, also there are upcoming webinars. So um, the next one I believe is on the 8th of December, looking at the changing shape of benefits within the, the wealth management industry. With um, a cut date set as well for our webinars in 2021, looking at reg tech and wealth tech. And we'd welcome you all to join us at those. But uh, until then, thank you once again for listening and have a lovely evening.